thank you for being here today. We are starting to see the COVID numbers begin to drop and some of the restrictions relaxed, but we know that we need to follow prevention strategies to keep this trend moving forward. Today's webinar will discuss some of the lessons that we have learned and look at the road ahead of us. This webinar helps Allergy and Asthma Network move our mission forward. Our mission has been the same since we began in 1985 to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through a four pillar approach of outreach, education, advocacy, and research. If you've been with us throughout our series, then you're very familiar with Dr. Kirby Parikh. Dr. Parikh is an adult and pediatric allergist immunologist at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. She is currently on faculty as clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. She's passionate about health policy and serves on the board of directors of the Advocacy Council of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She is the national spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network and makes frequent appearances as a medical contributor to all the major news outlets. Thank you for joining us once again today, Dr. Freak. So our program today, we will, as we always do, start out with a current state of COVID-19, provide an update on the vaccine and specific issues that are in the news. And then we'll take a look at how do we build the bridge to the next normal. And then finally, we'll wrap up our time with potential priorities for public and private sector, as well as school leaders. As we always like to do, let's get started with our first poll. What is the best category to describe you? So I'm gonna launch that poll. Are you a physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, school nurse, nurse, respiratory therapist, asthma educator, or, and or patient? So the category that best describes you. Again, we appreciate your participation in these polls. It's nice to make these uh, webinars much more interactive. Uh, as most of you know, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary of our COVID webinar series, and uh, we have uh, continued to see great registration numbers. I think today we're close to 1,000 people registered for the webinar. So we'll give this just another moment, and then we'll share who is on the line today. All right, I'm going to share the results. Looks like we've got 1% physician, 2% PA and nurse practitioner, 80 over 82% nurse, school nurse, 10% RTs, asthma educators, and 6% patients. So thank you all again. We love to see this multidisciplinary approach to education and awareness when it comes to COVID-19, but also to respiratory. So what's the current state of COVID-19 as we sit here today on March 4th of 2021? We just updated our dashboard based off of the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Center um, at 2.25 this afternoon, so just before we got started. And what you can see is that we now have over 115 million global cases with about 28.8 million of those coming from the U.S. By far and away, uh, the U.S. has been responsible for the majority of COVID-19 cases, uh, with India and Brazil coming in a very distant second at 10 and 11 million respective cases. And then when we look at the death toll, again, uh, based on the Hawkins data, the death toll has superseded 2.5 million deaths now, with over half a million of those coming from the U.S., and then Brazil and Mexico coming in at the, at the distant second and third with uh, 259,000 and 188,000 respectively. Again, this is the most revered, reliable source of data on the global level and the in-country level. And so we all always uh, turn to the Johns Hopkins coronavirus uh, COVID-19 dashboard for that information. And again, it, the numbers are, are startling as we quickly approach the one year mark of tracking and, and the pandemic. 
So what about the CDC data? Uh, the CDC data tends to lag a bit from the Johns Hopkins data, about a 24-hour lag. Here you can see the total case count of 28.5 million cases with 54,276 new cases. Um, and then the average daily case rates over the last seven days represented the darker blue or the higher case rates um, per state versus the lighter green being the lower case rates. But the good news is we have begun to see those trend lines drop over the last few weeks. Now, what about the headlines? What's in the news today? Um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine was approved for emergency use and should begin uh, shipping, shipping here in the next 24 to 48 hours. The good news is this is only one shot versus the other vaccines, which are two, and it has a slightly different efficacy rate. So the vaccines that are currently in the market with Pfizer and Moderna, greater than 90% efficacy. In the J&J, &J, it's 72% effective. And J&J &J has stepped forward to say they agree to provide over 100 million doses into the US market by June and 20 million by the end of this month. March. So that is a significant increase and in influx in the uh, doses that have been delivered um, and, and will help us get to that point of herd immunity much more rapidly. Japan is lifting its state of emergency in some areas, and more new research suggests that a single dose of the Pfizer and BioTech coronavirus vaccines can protect against asymptomatic or no symptom coronavirus infection. So that could help reduce transmission of the virus. Um, but again, it's still recommended that if you take the Pfizer uh, uh, coronavirus vaccine that you get both doses. So vaccine efficacy, again, I alluded to this just a moment ago, but here you can see it by the numbers. 94.1% on the Moderna two-dose vaccine, 94% the Pfizer Biotech vaccine, 72% the Johnson & Johnson, and then again, that 40% average for the flu vaccine, the one-dose vaccine on an annual basis. So the good news is, is if you're one of those people who are diligent about getting your flu vaccine, please go ahead, be first in line, put your hand up and, and volunteer to get the COVID-19 vaccine. You're getting a much more efficacious uh, vaccine in each of these. And so while it may be less in the J&J, &J, it's still highly effective and should be um, considered as, as a valuable source for vaccination. Now, when we look at the CDC COVID-19 case, COVID case rates week by week, again, we're watching that trend line since February 28th of last year. And you can see that we're certainly not at that uh, early pandemic levels where we were just beginning to track the data, but we have quickly approached that 50,000 new case by day mark over the last couple of weeks. And that's a very positive sign that we're seeing this dramatic decline from the height of the pandemic uh, back in December and January, November, December, January, where we were at over 200,000 new cases per day. So now let's go to our second poll question. Have you received your COVID-19 vaccine? So we'll launch the poll and ask you to go ahead and log in your response. Yes, no, no, but I plan to as soon as I can, or no, I'm still undecided. It's very interesting for me here in my household. Um, unfortunately, most of us are not eligible uh, at this time. And so we have not been able to be vaccinated. Uh, but my husband is an educator and has had his vaccine. And then my children that are living with some of the underlying risk conditions as well. But um, I, I'm certainly excited to see the day when uh, I can be in line as well. So let's. Give it just one more second and we'll close the poll and share the results. So 79% of you say yes, you have had your vaccine. That is remarkable. Um, again, every two weeks that we do these webinars, it, it's great to see that trend line and, and see the numbers trending in a positive way. 7% say no, 
9% say no, but I plan to as soon as I can, and 5% that say no, I'm still undecided. And again, at Allergy and Asthma Network, we certainly understand there are many different uh, considerations, and we respect your individual choice. We are advocating for people to get the vaccine because we think that that is uh, in the best interest of population health and, and the broader population, especially those living with underlying conditions like allergy and asthma and COPD. But definitely we respect everyone's individual choice. So now let's keep moving forward. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Parikh with our vaccine update and issues discussion. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for that great summary. So, you know, Getting back to the vaccine, um, it's, it's been a very um, wonderful time for science and innovation in that we have so much going on in the vaccine technology. The New York Times tracker is always fun to look at because you can see kind of how many trials are underway, um, vaccine candidates are out there, and where they are. So as you can see, six are authorized, um, six are approved for emergency use and four unfortunately have been abandoned but you know that happens um, that's why we do these trials to see what works and what doesn't work but there's more coming down the pi pipeline as you can see next slide so the vaccine information um you know i'm happy to report that you know we have out of 107 million doses about 80 million have been uh, given to date um, we're hoping that gap continues to get smaller and smaller because we need this rollout to move quickly. Um, and about 52 million have at least had one or more doses, and 26 million have had two doses. And that's, I, you know, I'd really like to see that number a lot higher as well. But, you know, even though it sounds like a lot, we still have a long ways to go because only about 21% of the population um, has had um, either, you know, one or, or more doses and only 10% are fully vaccinated at two doses. And uh, Dr. Fauci and many others estimate that we really need that number closer to 75 to 80% to reach that herd immunity. So looking forward, you know, COVID was a leading cause of death in 2020. In fact, they said it was the deadliest year since World War II, um, all of our life expectancies dropped across the board, which is not good news. But what are we gonna be seeing in 2021 and beyond? And what we're hoping is that, you know, uh, as more people get vaccinated, this will no longer be the leading cause of death, but we still have to remember that, you know, heart disease, cancer, many of these things that people put treatments on hold because of COVID are still very much, uh, you know, around and prevalent, and we can't ignore those as well. And then pregnancy and COVID-19. So pregnant women are now enrolled in the vaccine trials, um, which is great news. I know we've vaccinated, I think, 30,000 or more pregnant uh, women by now. And there's participants that are in the US, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Mozambique, all over the world, South Africa, UK. And it, this is important. And the reason being is that pregnant women have an increased risk of complications from contracting COVID-19, uh, and they're at a heightened risk of developing severe illness. So if you're pregnant and you get COVID-19, there's a big chance you may have um, complications. Um, your baby may not make it, you may not make it. There's been a lot of reports of preterm deliveries. So it's in pregnant women's best interest to get the vaccine. And, and we've had um, data recently released from a registry that actually showed that there were no increased complications with pregnant women who had the vaccine versus um, the general population. So it's all very reassuring that this is uh, safe. Next slide. Now masks, um, still don't understand why this is controversial, but it still is almost a year into the pandemic. So masking is important, it helps us reduce spread, but there are some updates. Um, Americans may still uh, wear masks outside their homes even a year from now, and we have to get used to the fact that this may last for a while. Um, also, we predicted that the country would return to a certain uh, degree of normality by fall, which is also great news. Um, but, you know, people need to stick to their schedule, get their second shot. And we do have to keep masking because, as you saw in the previous slides, only about 10% of the population is fully vaccinated. There's still considerable spread. There's still considerable variants. Um, so please don't let your guard down in that regard. 
So building the bridge to the next normal, you know, um, the reason why we say next normal is it's going to be a gradual, you know, dimmer rather than a flip of a light switch. Um, so according to McKinsey report, uh, to America's leaders, innov innovators, and change makers, even as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, a return to normal existence is in sight. Getting the end game right could save thousands of lives. So I think that's very well said. You know, we're so close, um, but we don't want to make any rash decisions or moves in which we could jeopardize getting to the, ne the new normal. Next slide. So hopefully we see the United States gain a decisive upper hand in the fight against COVID-19. You know, we've lost over half a million Americans. Um, we're also engaged in an unprecedented race to vaccinate as many people as possible. Um, we need to keep using all those public health measures to minimize death. So that's the distancing, masking, or even double masking. Um, and it's reasonable to hope that the first half of 2021 can be a bridge to what we call normalcy. So it won't happen immediately, but we can start moving in that direction. Uh, we're hoping a lot of the social and economic life can return um, to normal without fear of excess mortality, which is great news. Next slide. So the good news, you know, vaccine appears to be effective, people are getting vaccinated. The not so good news is we keep having challenges every day especially with the variants um, and a lot of ish logistical issues with the vaccine rollout them itself. Um, you know, we, we know that all the companies are now starting to test booster doses against these variants uh, and adapt as we go. And hopefully improvements in the rollout are being um, implemented as well. Uh, critical insights, you know, containment policy only works if it leads to changes in personal behavior. So, uh, the policy doesn't mean anything if people don't do it, right? So basically, even if it comes from the top, you know, states have to be involved in enforcement. Individuals are very much involved. You know, this is something where all of us are in this together and all of our actions matter. So we all have to work together. Otherwise, we as a society will never uh, move past this pandemic. And, you know, COVID-19 cases have grown uh, despite these stringent policies and increases in masking and testing. Uh, and the reason being is, again, it's, it's not the policies, it's, it's the people, <laughs> it's individual people. So if people aren't uh, abiding by the policies and if every state is adapting their own version of the policies, then of course, um, you know, they won't work. We, we need everyone to kind of be on the same page about this. Um, so, you know, Public policies have remained consistent since July, uh, and good news, the number of people masking has risen, but it's still not where it needs to be, uh, and as that's why the cases are, are soaring. Uh, luckily, we've gotten much better with other things like testing and even the personal protective equipment, even though we still even have long ways to go with both of those. <laughs> So mortality is driven by protecting or not protecting those most at risk. So of course, this is very important. People over 75 are 1,000 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than a 15-year-old. Um, we have to protect the most vulnerable. Before the vaccine, you know, we had very strict isolation. Many of us, um, you know, didn't get to see our parents or grandparents for months at a time. May still not have seen them. Uh, and then, you know, the vaccine is comes with its own challenges. You know, I know many in this age group that are still having difficulty getting their vaccine doses, which should not be the case. Unfortunately, there's a lot of logistical barriers. Um, and then economic support for older people in isolation may help sustain them as we build the bridge. And I would even go so far to say emotional support. You know, I mean, many, many people have been isolated. Uh, loneliness is setting in and other mental health issues as well. So uh, older people are much more likely to die if they contract COVID-19, um, you know, as well, as, especially in that group between 75 to 84. Um, and as you can see, the chances are one in nine if you're in that age group versus one in 9,000 if you're in the five to 17 age group. So it's reassuring for our children and pediatric population, but, you know, we still need to protect um, uh, parents, grandparents, and the elderly. Third critical insight is that, you know, simple and sustainable is often better than striving for perfection. And I couldn't agree with this more. Um, 
I know most people are tired. They don't want to comply with the public policies and shifting policies doesn't really help. Um, you know, the best thing is to kind of keep things as simple as possible so people can follow it. That's why we keep reiterating, just, you know, keep masking, keep hand washing, keep distancing. It's simple, but it works. Um, and, then, and then a guideline that's 70% effective followed by one that's 80 per, followed by 80% of people is much better than if you have something that's perfect that only 10 or 15% of people will follow. So that's why, um, you know, we don't recommend that everybody wears those N95 masks, you know, even though there is a shortage and we need to preserve them, they're very, very uncomfortable. And as healthcare workers, we wear them 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And, you know, it's, it's very uh, tiring. So most of the population would not do that. They wouldn't comply. So that's a good example of why it's better to have, uh, you know, a 70% guideline that more people are going to follow, um, such as a cloth mask or double masking which is much more comfortable and still very efficacious. Um, so si significant portions of the UK and US po populations are not in compliance with ma um, main public health protocols. So uh, masks and distancing luckily has gotten much better, but with testing and isolation, you know, um, people are not so good about doing this and not so good at complying. Uh, especially, I know a lot of different states have quarantine rules. It, there's not really much enforcement of it either. So this unfortunately contributes to the continued spread of the infection. Um, then insight number four, you know, the public sector can catalyze private sector innovation. Um, you know, with the government participate uh, partners with the private sector, we've seen uh, breakthroughs occur and in record speed. Uh, for example, Operation Warp Speed sped the vaccine to the market. That's a perfect example of what really we can achieve when all of the private uh, companies work with public agencies and all pool their resources together. National collaborations have been more successful than local ones, and I'm sure you all heard um, Merck announce that they would actually help Johnson & Johnson create more doses of their vaccine so every American would have a vaccine um, by the spring. So that's huge, you know, and, and I think more of this hopefully will remain after the pandemic too, the collaboration of the public and private sectors. Um, you know, and then again, the vaccine development is the perfect example. It's a fraction of time. Uh, as you can see, these other infectious diseases, it's taken years, if not decades, to develop a reliable vaccine. And COVID-19 was developed in less than a year. Uh, you know, and then this doesn't mean that it was rushed or we shouldn't trust it. But the whole point is what can be achieved when all of us are on the same page working to together towards a goal. And it doesn't have to be something as fancy as a vaccine or something scientific. Even if all of us work together in masking, distancing, being courteous to one another, we can get out of this pandemic faster. So COVID-19 is a public health crisis and much more, which is true. You know, um, it's not just illness, but there's so much secondary harm that we've already seen and probably will see for years to come. Unemployment, uh, learning loss for our children, substance abuse, uh, suicide, mental health issues, so many things, unfortunately, have come as secondary side effects. Uh, the bridge to normalcy needs to be a time when we address not only the underlying issue of SARS-CoV-2 transmission, but also the restoration of our economy and the secondary effects of COVID-19. Uh, Americans are really hurting and in more ways than one, and, and we can't ignore the others and just focus on the infection alone. So, you know, secondary harm, unfortunately, has been immense. 41% uh, of adults have deferred care as a result of the pandemic, potentially costing the system um, 125 to $200 billion, and not to mention costing them their, their lives, you know, and their health. Uh, you know, it, last year was the deadliest year since World War II, not only because of COVID-19, it was because a lot of secondary illnesses that weren't cared for, heart disease, cancer, uh, what have you. So, you know, we can't stop taking care of ourselves just because we're in a pandemic. Um, anxiety and depression have more than doubled during COVID-19, which is very, very concerning, um, you know, especially amongst essential workers, healthcare workers. Um, they're they're nearly, nearing a breaking point, if not past it. Um, learning loss among kindergarten through fifth grade is considerable, and it's far worse for students of color. Um, as you can see, you know, more than 50% 
uh, for st students of color in math through uh, are at negative 41, whereas um, in the counterparts are white students, there's a, a difference and uh, it's much less so. However, there is learning loss across the board. Uh, police departments in cities across the country are also seeing a rapid rise in dom domestic abuse cases, uh, which is also very concerning. And I know there's been even uh, child abuse. So there are, these are all things that we can't ignore and they can be just as harmful as the pandemic itself. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Tanya um, to go on from here. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Parikh. As always, so fascinating to think about, again, what is that next normal? Um, certainly, we uh, hope that we are on the downhill side of the worst of the pandemic and are moving towards normal. And yet, what we have to realize is that our society and we as people and individuals are forever changed as a result of COVID-19. And I really appreciate the way that you brought that forth today. So now we wanna turn our focus to some of the potential priorities for public, private sector, and for school leaders. So it's important as we talk about this to really define what is the end game, to begin to set realistic expectations, and to boost morale. All of this that we're sharing today is coming from the McKinsey Report, American 2021, uh, that was released earlier this year on building that bridge to normalcy. And it's important to recognize that McKinsey continues to encourage us to seek that additional sacrifice that's needed by everyone in order to really get to where we need to be with the pandemic. We have to continue to identify an endpoint that's going to increase hope, increase our resolve. And certainly, I know that I do, my children do. They want to know when. When can I get back to attending a wedding or hugging my friends? I mean, we're planning my oldest uh, child's wedding in June, and we're, we're worried about can we get the full um, guest list uh, there, or will there be those restrictions? And what about, you know, can we have a normal Thanksgiving? I was very encouraged to see uh, this week in the news, Dr. Fauci say, I do expect that we'll get back to a greater sense of normalcy by the time we get to the holiday season of 2021. But these are all very important as we look to that next normal. And then we have to triple down on vaccine adoption. Um, we have to, to realize that in order to return to normalcy, we must get those high vaccine adoption rates. As Dr. Freak said, the numbers are 70 to 80% needed to reach that herd immunity. And currently we're at about 20% with one dose, 10% with two. So we still have a long way to go. I would call out though that I just got a note from a friend in Alaska and perhaps there's lessons that could be learned there because Alaska now has 15% of its total population completely vaccinated. So they are leading our nation in getting their population fully vaccinated. We also have to re realize that this be has to become a matter of conviction, convenience, and costlessness. And so we have to have those major shifts and components across the different sectors, whether it be the public and private sector and how they can come together to launch really an unprecedented campaign around vaccine adoption, whether it be the government and how they can consider ways to develop and innovate within the infrastructure to, to ensure vaccine adoption. Uh, you know, and then when we turn to our healthcare system, healthcare providers and payers, how do they put vaccination at the very top of their agenda? And then is there a mechanism by which employers can support their employees to get vaccinated. We have seen this already where some employers are offering incentives uh, for their staff to get vaccinated. They're offering days off, uh, financial incentives, and, and certainly, especially those that are on the front line, it's becoming very, very critical and important that they take those additional steps to ensure their safety. So how do we prioritize those tactics with the highest return on investment. 
we know that individual choice matters most. I said this at the outset when we asked about your own decision in getting vaccinated, um, but we respect your individual choice. We know that these decisions are not made lightly and that there are many different influences as to why a person may make the choice they do at the given time. The government and private sector leaders have a significant role to play in really enabling this public adoption. So they need to offer guidance, they need to provide paid time off, housing support, employer-led testing, contact tracing, all of these are key tactics and strategies that will yield the highest return on our investment. We need to go all out to protect those at high risk. Again, Dr. Parikh reinforced it in her talk of, this, of the community that is high risk, those that are over 75, living with these uh, comorbidities. Even with that improved containment, lives continue to still be at risk during this bridge period. So how do we protect the most vulnerable and, and truly uh, take care of those who need it the most? How do we create a team that can plan for the unexpected downside scenarios that may happen in the coming days? We need to be prepared to deal with setbacks and with new challenges. You can't turn on the television without hearing about a new variant of the virus. We don't know what the duration of immunity may be, and there are still considerable concerns about long-term safety issues around the vaccine. And time will answer many of these questions. And yet we have to fully understand and recognize that there may be some unexpected twists and turns in this next normal. Maybe not likely, but we've learned that nothing is impossible. And in this time and this day and era where um, so many things are going on in our cancel culture. If you're not with me, you're against me. It's been wonderful to see the scientific community come together and advance the science so rapidly in this area. It has literally saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. And I, for one, hope that that spirit of collaboration and cooperation continues as we move forward. So next, let's go to a poll question. And what is the status of school attendance in your area at this time? Um, we know that this is one of the, the big questions that's lingering in everyone's mind. Are the kids back in school? Can we reduce that learning loss? So go ahead and log in your response. Um, are your schools in person all day, every day? Um, are they a hybrid, some days in schools, some days at home? Are you still in a full-time virtual learning Set, uh, setting or model? Or are there different models for different age groups? Some school systems have adopted where um, the younger children are going to school and the older children are virtual learning. So log in now what your uh, response is in your community and we'll share with the group. Give it just another moment or two. Looks like we've got about 65, 70% of the responses. So I'll go ahead now and close the poll and share the results. So it looks like 23% are full time back in school in person learning. 37% have a hybrid where some days they're in and some days they're virtual. 21% at home and virtual learning all the time, so about one in five, and then 23% different models for different age groups and 7% report other. So very interesting that we're still seeing such uh, an even distribution across these different um, school attendance policies and restrictions at this time. Now, what is the academic impact that's going on in schools? Again, we know that early childhood education is so very dependent on sensory and social experience. Uh, you know, you cannot easily replace these concepts at distance learning or remote learning. And recent research has even demonstrated that remote learning will result in considerable learning loss and could have very long-term effects on especially these early childhood education students. 
the developmental losses are significant. Uh, um, it's unlikely that distance learning really can serve as that suitable replacement for children in the very young ages. Closing schools separates kids from the important learning time and the learning tools that are used in the classroom. It also separates them from their peers and from adults. And so oftentimes uh, we know that these children aren't interacting at, in, a, in as healthy a manner as they would if they were doing in-person schooling or extracurricular activities or sports. So it is a balance, right? Um, the, the, should we reopen schools or not? I know with my husband being an educator, um, he's been on a task force at his school and there's been this constant back and forth. Uh, there is a large portion of the parents who want the schools to reopen. There is a large portion of parents who don't. And so it's that critical balance of health risk of school reopenings versus the often ignored cost of the continued school closures. And we are pleased to see that at least this conversation is taking hold and that more people are aware of the learning loss and the challenges that remote learning, virtual learning is having on uh, students and on the, the education system as a whole. So we begin to prepare for the other side of the bridge, uh, knowing that there will come a day when we will be in a post-COVID-19 world. Although it seems very far off as we sit here today, um, and certainly not as soon as most of us would like, we need to prepare for the transition. We need to ask ourselves, will we be a risk-averse society? Will this forever change who we are as people? Will mask be a forever thing? Is that one of the new normals that uh, people will just be more willing to mask up, um, perhaps during cold and flu season, or perhaps if they are in those higher risk uh, groups, people groups? And are we really ready to feel safe again? Will we return to that uh, going about our quote unquote normal everyday lives without this cloud hanging over us of when the next pandemic may come. So now we're going to turn to your questions. We hope that today has been um, hopeful and insightful and that you've learned something as we continue to bridge to the next normal, but we want to hear directly from you. So go ahead and write your questions in the question box of the control panel. We're going to get to as many as we possibly can in the time remaining. We've got about uh, 16, 17 minutes. And uh, also don't forget that if you need that certificate of attendance, now would be a great time to get that from the handouts pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. So let's go to the Q&A. Um, the first question actually I'm gonna ask Dr. Parikh is in regard to the news that hit over the last couple of days regarding the states and the governor's decisions to release the restrictions and remove the mask mandates. What are your thoughts and do you anticipate that we'll see uh, those spike in numbers again as a result? Um, yeah, so that's, that's a very good question and one that's been discussed in the medical community as well. You know, I, I think it may have been a little too soon uh, to do both measures at the same time, especially with the masks. I understand, uh, you know, a need for our economy to get back on track, but um, we don't have enough people vaccinated, especially in Texas, which is our largest state. Um, I think 93% of the population still is not vaccinated. I think only 7% is. So uh, I think it was definitely too soon for that. And we may very well see spikes because the masks not only help with spikes, but also they help prevent um, new formation of variants. Because, you know, as Dr. Fauci says, if the virus can't replicate, it can't mutate. And if we're removing that barrier, uh, you know, it is very worrisome and uh, in Mississippi as well. Um, I think a, a smarter approach would, would be maybe start with the businesses, but still encourage uh, masking or double masking and those other protocols, but removing both at once, both barriers is, is definitely very worrisome. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, it, it has been um, definitely surprising to see these for the most part, southern states 
make these decisions to, to move forward in this way at this time. Um, our next question comes from Cynthia and she says, would you please address the deaths that have been connected to the vaccine and the, uh, their, those deaths affect on vaccination reluctance or hesitancy? Uh, yeah, so that's another great question. So there's actually been zero deaths that have been connected to the vaccine. So uh, anything else that you have heard is actually not true. Um, there any time, you know, deaths occur or other um, events occur, there is a tendency to want to link it to the an event that may have occurred in their dis um anything that occurs now around the time people get the vaccine or in the trial is being reported it's being investigated and they've found no links to any of these vaccines causing deaths which is great news but unfortunately i think uh media portrayals of it social media uh information the infodemic uh has contributed to vaccine hesitancy because unfortunately people have linked um, these deaths to the vaccine, even though it's not true. Uh, I won't take up too much time, but one example was a personal one. Actually, a colleague of mine um, actually had a miscarriage and all of these anti-vax groups put her name and picture all over social media saying that the vaccine caused her miscarriage, when in mm -hmm. fact, she miscarried prior to even receiving the vaccine. So, um, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's just a perfect example of something very painful taken out of context and unfortunately, uh, people believing it. So I just want you to be very careful with where you go for your sources of information, because there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there as well. Absolutely. And to that point, uh, number one, I'm sorry to hear about your, your friend's loss, but definitely I also want to remind everyone that our very next webinar will be on vaccine hesitancy, and we will um, highlight some of the key ways that we're addressing vaccine adoption and, and uh, really these concerns that have been voiced today, as well as those reliable sources of information, because you're absolutely right that that credibility is so critical and, and important. Now, the next question comes from Madeline, and she says, is the Pfizer vaccine still fully effective if you get the second dose one day early? So on day 20 versus day 21 after the uh, Yes, no, that's a great question. Yes, it is still effective. Um, you know, even in the clinical trials, we had a three to four day window before and after because, you know, it's understandable people have lives and things going on. So as close as you can get to that three week window for Pfizer and the four week mark for Moderna is great. But if you do need to take it a little early or a little late, it's okay. Um, and just as the more important thing is that you take it. Absolutely. Yes. And that has been so there's been some confusion there, but but again, you do get that protection, even if it is not exactly at that 21 day mark. Um, now the next question comes from Jennifer. We've been told that we have both doses of vaccines. We, if we get both doses of vaccine, we should be protected for at least 90 days. Uh, what happens after the 90 days? Are we at risk again, or will we have to quarantine if exposed to a COVID positive person? Yeah, so the 90 day recommendation is uh, mostly based on the fact that one, we know at least for 90 days um, with all of these vaccines that the immunity is, is good and lasting. I have a feeling it will likely extend past that 90 days, but that mark has been given as, um, a side, as just to be on the cautious side that people don't throw caution to the wind. But as we learn more about how long immunity lasts, how frequently we'll have to get vaccines, I suspect that 90 days will be extended. But if you are outside that window for now, you should follow all the public health measures, um, such as quarantining and isolating, uh, just to be on the safe side. Okay. And, and this follows on that, and that is in regard to, you know, we know with other mRNA vaccines um, that there is the need for boosters. And do you think that we will see that type of approach with the COVID vaccine where we may need boosters over time? All right. Again, it's one of those we have to wait and see what develops. You know, um, the honest truth is we don't know. You know, everything with this pandemic, we're learning as we go, uh, you know, building the plane as we fly. So the good news is this, uh, the coronaviruses don't mutate. Uh, as frequently as let's say influenza, where we definitely need a new shot every flu season. 
But given these new variants, uh, things may have to be modified. So I know both Moderna and Pfizer are already looking at the booster shots for the variants per se. Um, and the, the biggest thing I could say is stay tuned. We'll see you know, what the recommendations are. But hopefully um, it won't be as frequent as yearly, but we, we don't know yet. Uh, I agree. I think that time will tell, um, but we are hopeful that uh, we will get ahead of that and, and, and understand more as, as we uh, continue through the science in, in this process. Now, the next question is in regard to vaccine hesitancy and the current percentages regarding um, vaccine hesitancy. On the flu, what is the percentage of people that normally get the flu vaccine, Dr. Freak? Um, so that's actually a good question. So it this year we saw much higher amount of people receive the flu vaccine, but there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy around uh, that as well. Um, I don't know the exact statistics, but uh, the flu vaccine, for whatever reason, has a lot of hesitancy around it. Luckily, a lot of the childhood immunizations um, we have much better uh, turnout for. Um, but again, a lot of it, I think, is related to misinformation. Tanya, I don't know if you know the exact percentage, but I'm not sure. I know it that did. this year it increased for sure. It's increased from year to year. Um, typically, it's around 30% of the population that gets the flu vaccine, 30 to 40%. Um, and, and again, it, it does vary based off of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, um, access to health care, a lot of those systemic issues that we've talked about before. Um, but in in regard to the COVID vaccine and vaccine hesitancy, uh, we, again, we see a very vastly different um, scenario. And so um, I was actually, you know, looking at some of this because this is our next topic on, on March 17th for the webinar. And in the Black community, for example, uh, about six months ago, it was less than 20% of individuals who said that they would get vaccinated. So around the September timeframe um, that that data was collected. Um, we've gone back and recollected that data throughout the last six months, and now it is just over 50%. So the good news is, is that we're seeing vaccine hesitancy you know, sort of decrease and more people be willing, um, the need is to make sure that we have vaccine available and accessible. And uh, again, those factors of convenience and low to no cost, because those are all gonna be barriers if, if you know they persist. And so uh, again, we will address this topic of vaccine hesitancy in its fullness on Mar uh, March 17th. And we hope that you will join us for that one as well. Uh, just one one last point I wanted to make was you can't really compare vaccine hesitancy with flu and this vaccine because with flu, we actually have the luxury of herd immunity. It's, it's a virus that even though it shifts year to year, our immune system is, is used to it. This is a novel virus where, you know, we really need that herd immunity, I would argue, even more urgently um, because our immune systems don't have that immunologic memory. So I wouldn't compare the two in terms of um, the hesitancy or urgency, if that makes That's sense. That's a really valid point and, and very important to, to note. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now, our next question is, does having an autoimmune condition and asthma actually increase the risk of having the cytokine storm if infected with COVID-19? What's your view as an immunologist? Um, that's actually a very good question. So initially in the pandemic, we were concerned that you know, asthmatics would have a much higher risk of severe COVID-19, given that is a respiratory disease. Um, and they are at higher, you know, they do get sick, but we found in some ways that asthma and allergies, um, th that population was not as high risk as we initially thought. In fact, I don't think asthma even made it into the top 10 of those for severe COVID, whereas COPD did. And a few thoughts amongst that is that the inflammation from asthma and allergies is a little bit different than the inflammation that we see from cytokine storm. But those with autoimmune disease, though, may be at higher risk because that inflammation is a little bit different than allergic inflammation. And again, that's why it's really important to have all of your chronic conditions well controlled 
because as much as you know the infection is dangerous, it's really the inflammation of COVID-19 which kills you and which causes all those terrible things like heart failure, lung failure, kidney failure. So um, that's why we encourage everybody with any chronic illness, especially an inflammatory illness, to make sure you're on all your appropriate medications, whether that be you know your controller, uh, biologics, whether you have autoimmune disease or asthma or allergies, um, and, and to not stop those things without the guidance of your physician. Because we did find even those with autoimmune disease, those who were well controlled did far better than those who were not. You know, um, obesity, diabetes, heart disease hypertension, those still remain the number one risk factors. So if you still have those, you're still, you still need to be careful, you know, um, if you're an asthmatic with those also, or an autoimmune patient that also has those illnesses. So this is a really interesting question um, that I can't wait to hear your response to, Dr. Greek. It's from Kelly, and she says, what would you tell a patient who is concerned with the lower efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine? If that's all that's available, how would you um, encourage them to not be afraid or reluctant given the 72% versus 94%? Right. So, you know, one, I would say, you know, take it first and foremost, because it's not really lower efficacy. And I think that comparison is made, but it's not a fair comparison for multiple reasons. You know, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, those trials and that data kind of wrapped up before we even had any variants circulating, circulating in the population. So we can't really say that it's more effective unless all at time, you know, so that's, that's one thing that we can't really uh, compare them that way. Um, the second thing too is Johnson and Johnson actually was a hundred percent effective at preventing death and a hundred percent effective at preventing hospitalization, which is huge. In my mind, those are kind of the worst things that you could get from COVID-19. So it will save your life. It will keep you out of the hospital. It will do the same thing for your loved ones. So um, I actually think it's very effective. Uh, and the benefits are that it's one shot. So as soon as you get your first shot, you'll have immunity in a couple of weeks, whereas with the others, you have to wait uh, much longer. So um, that, that's what I tell people when they're concerned about efficacy, that you can't really compare the two. Um, even in areas of the world where those variants were rampant, so like South Africa, it still prevented death completely and hospitalizations completely. Yeah. And, and I love that point that it, in 100% of cases, it, it, it kept you out of the hospital and kept you alive, right? And that's the, that's right. the vital numbers. Now, this is a, a good question as well. Um, could you comment on what's happening with clinical trials for children and the plans to vaccinate children? And then the follow-up um, is actually, can we reach herd immunity if children are not vaccinated? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently, um, children 12 and up are being studied in both Moderna and Pfizer trials. And I know the plan is to start enrolling for six and up. It hasn't started yet. And I think the projection is we should be able to at least start uh, immunizing older children by the summer. So hopefully before the school year. And I think, you know, children, we can't forget them. I think they are a key piece in herd immunity because even though they may not get as sick, they can still be um, carriers of the disease or, you know, either asymptomatic or mild carriers of the disease. So absolutely, I think children need to be included to reach that herd immunity. Um, and hopefully by the summer, we'll be able to start vaccinating. Already Pfizer is approved down to age 16 for certain groups. Um, and children's immune systems are very different at every age. So that's why each age group has to be studied and approved separately. Okay. Yeah. Very, very helpful. And, and again, I think that um, it would be much more difficult to reach that herd immunity level without the vaccination of children. Um, and, and we're taking those steps necessary to make sure that children can be protected as well. Now, we've got time for one more question, and, and it is a little bit of a controversial one. So uh, I'll be interested to see your response. Some, this comes from William, and he says, some Catholic bishops are actually suggesting that people avoid the J&J &J vaccine since it's made from aborted cells. Do you think this will impact the distribution of all vaccines? I mean, it, it, that's a great question. It may. It all depends on, uh, you know, how people, how, how people listen and that impact. I know a lot of uh, Catholic leaders, including the Pope, actually have advocated the opposite to receive the vaccines, uh, including the J&J &J one. 
given the um, public health threat. Um, regarding the aborted fetuses, you know, there is very, very uh, little amounts of like, it's not really even, I, I hate using that word because it, that's not the word that's used. It's basically cells uh, from uh, cell lines that have been harvested that are used. So it's not really aborted fetuses that have been used. And I think that's another perfect example of misinformation that one, you know, that statement isn't inherently true. And two, there's actually a lot of religious leaders and Catholic leaders advocating for the vaccine as well. So, but I think, yes, you're absolutely right. It could affect hesitancy um, depending on what an individual's beliefs are and, uh, you know, and who is advising them. So that's even more reason that uh, I think community leaders, religious leaders are very, very important in the whole vaccine hesitancy conversation. Absolutely. We agree as well. And that's one of the reasons why we've partnered with faith-based community leaders to get the word out around vaccine adoption. Thank you so much, Dr. Parika. As always, you did a great job of that rapid fire of questions. And, and we could go on for hours with all the questions that continue to pour in. But time has exhausted for today. So I just want to take a moment and once again, thank you all for listening as we've looked at building the bridge towards the next normal. Again, we cannot say thank you enough for your time, your expertise, Dr. Preet, but also each of you for weighing in and helping us to guide this journey toward the next normal. Please do plan to join us for our next webinars. We have several that are upcoming. Breathe Easier, Smoking Facts and Cessation Tips with Dr. Todd Marr on March 25th. And again, you can register on our webinar page under news of our website, allergyasthmanetwork.org. Once again, I'm Tanya Winders, and on behalf of the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, we want to thank you for your time and attention today. We want to continue to work with you each day to ensure that we can all breathe better together. Thank you, and have a great day.